Um, my name is Hamsa. I'm a graduate student at Stanford, and I'm really excited to be here at Medicine X uh, to talk about personalized medical decision making. If the clicker works. Oh, all right. Um, well, this is joint work with my advisor at the Stanford Graduate School of Business, uh, Mosin Bayathi, who's there right now. Uh, I wanted to start off with a quote by William Osler in 1892. And he said, if it were not for the great variability between individuals, then medicine might as well be a science, not an art. I really like this quote because it underscores why medicine is so difficult. And that's because every patient is different. And when we're making treatment decisions for these patients, we really have to think about their electronic health record histories, we have to think about their genetic information, their lifestyle choices, and so on. So this is a very complex decision-making problem. And um, as Laverne talked in the keynote yesterday, uh, we can try to utilize big data to try to help guide us in making these decisions. And that's really what I'm going to be talking about, too. So the goal here is to personalize medical decisions for patients based on patient information, like their health records, like their genes, or their biomarkers. And one example where this actually worked really well in practice was the BATTLE clinical trial. So this was a trial that was looking at non-small cell lung cancer patients. And researchers actually found that the optimal chemotherapeutic agent for a patient can actually be predicted by biomarkers found in the patient's tumor biopsy. So in this clinical trial, instead of just doing a randomized setup, they did something different. Um, they looked at the patient's biomarkers and tried to figure out which chemotherapeutic agent to give them and then actually personalize the therapy. And they found that they were able to greatly increase uh, patient uh, cancer remission rates and actually save lives. So this is an important and worthy goal. And I'm here to talk about some of the statistical challenges that might be associated with that. Um, so one goal here is to actually find patient subgroups where we can find this heterogeneity uh, so that we can use that information in our treatment decisions. But then the question is, how do you actually find these patient subgroups? So typically, the approach people take is you have some randomized clinical trial data. Um, you retrospectively go look at it and see if you can identify correlations between patient factors as well as clinical outcomes. So this can actually be pretty tricky because we live in a world with big data. So instead of having a few clinical patient factors, we're talking about you know, all this health record information, all the procedures that have been done on you, the medications you've taken, your diagnoses, some genetic information, and so on. So that actually means that there are a lot of different patient factors. And this introduces a problem of false positives. So when you have a lot of different variables against which you're trying to correlate patient outcomes, you're probably going to find something, but it might not be real. It might just be a spurious correlation. So in a kind of amusing way to um, illustrate the pitfalls with this kind of approach, um, some researchers looked at whether they can correlate astrological birth sign with patient outcomes. And um, they actually managed to find some statistically significant results. Um, so they don't control for multiple hypotheses or anything. And basically, they find that, you know, Sagittarians are more likely to get humerus fractures. And oh, these are obviously not real causal claims. And this is exactly the kind of finding that we want to avoid. So one way to try to uh, get around this problem is to take an adaptive approach to our clinical trials. So typically, we always do a randomized allocation procedure, but instead we can do an adaptive trial. So I'm going to kind of outline this in three steps. So during the course of the clinical trial, uh, we get some initial outcomes data, and we can try to infer what the relevant patient subgroups are, where we think the heterogeneity lies. And then we can confirm whether this heterogeneity actually exists by modifying how we allocate the treatments to the patients. So instead of doing it in a randomized way, we can in use the inferred subgroups and use that information to actually choose how we give the treatments to patients during the clinical trial. 
And then we get more outcomes information and we can confirm if this heterogeneity actually exists or not and update our hypothesized subgroups based on this data. So this is like a loop that you keep iterating on this during the trial and this is a you know, statistically sound way to get the meaningful subgroups that we hope to get. Okay, so just to kind of formalize that a little bit, um, we're going to associate patients with covariates, and this can include whatever you want, health record data or genes or whatever. And we're going to model how well a treatment performs on a patient using a linear predictive model. So basically, we're trying to learn a function that takes the patient covariates and spits out how effective we think the treatment is going to be. And once we learn these models, we'll be able to minimize incorrect treatment decisions. So this kind of a methodology uh, has been well studied in the statistics and computer science literature. It's called uh, a contextual bandit. And uh, a lot of methods have been introduced. But the problem is that these methods all converge very slowly with big data, which is exactly the kind of regime that we kind of want to go into. It's kind of the future. So we're going to take a slightly different approach. So our main insight is that uh, even though there are a lot of different patient covariates and we have all this big data, only a small subset of them are going to be really predictive of whether a particular treatment is effective or not. So there might be a ton of biomarkers for the patient, but only a subset of them are going to be relevant to uh, figuring out if that non-small cell lung cancer chemotherapy will work on that patient or not. Or you might have a whole bunch of medications that might interact badly with your medication, but probably only a subset of them really matter. You should be careful about those. Uh, so given that you have this kind of nice structure on the problem, instead of using these classical traditional statistical models, you can try to leverage um, sort of big data techniques. Um, so we're going to use something called the lasso estimator, which helps pick up on uh, this kind of uh, sm uh, this kind of setting where only a small subset of features are important. So our algorithm is what we called the lasso bandit, uh, and how it works is in four steps. Uh, first, during the course of the trial, instead of estimating a regular predictive model, we're going to estimate a lasso predictive model. Um, and then we're going to randomize a few patients into each treatment. So that part is the same as a classical clinical trial. But then after that, for the remaining patients, we're going to optimize them based on the subgroups that we've inferred. And then we're going to use the outcomes that we observe for those patients to update these predictive models and also the inferred subgroups. And then we repeat this over the course of the trial. And basically, this is going to give us the true predictive models and the subgroups. OK, so this kind of an algorithm we actually can show has some very nice statistical properties. Uh, we can prove that it converges to the true subgroups. But more importantly, we can show that it converges exponentially faster than existing methods uh, in this big data setting. Uh, so it seems useful, at least from a theoretical standpoint, but we wanted to test it on real clinical data retrospectively so that we can see if it you know, actually performs better. So we decided to do a case study on warfarin dosing. So as you guys probably know, warfarin is this very commonly prescribed blood thinner. There's about 30 million prescriptions a year in the United States. And it's a very challenging problem because the optimal warfarin dose for a patient can be off by a factor by up to 10 based on patient-specific factors. So it's uh, pretty tricky. But on the other hand, you also really want to get the dose right, because if you start too low, the patient's going to maybe suffer a stroke. And if you start too high, the patient might suffer internal bleeding. So there are some very highly adverse consequences. So what physicians currently do in practice is um, they start the patient off on a medium dose, which is 5 milligrams. Uh, and then they work with the patient, and they very carefully monitor the INR ratio, and they adjust the dose based on um, how stable the patient's INR ratio is. And this adjusting procedure can take you know, up to a few weeks. And during this time, it exposes the patient to these adverse consequences if 
um, the dose was not right. And actually, one study estimates that warfarin incorrect dosing actually accounts for about 17% of emergency department visits in the United States amongst older adults. So our goal was to use patient-specific factors to predict what the initial dose of the patient should be instead of always assigning them the medium dose. So uh, there's this public patient data set. It's a really nice data set by the International Warfarin Pharmacogenetics Consortium. Um, and they have about 5,500 patients and 100 patient-specific variables. So this includes demographic information, the reason the patient is getting the warfarin treatment, various conditions they have, various medications they're taking, and um, selected genetic factors that are known to correlate with the optimal warfarin dose. Uh, so this is exactly the kind of data we want to incorporate in our decision-making procedure, right? So it's electronic health record data and some genetic information. Um, and how we model this problem is we're going to consider giving a patient a low, medium, or high dose as three different treatment possibilities. So this is just for the initial dose. Um, and then we're going to have a binary reward. So did we dose the patient correctly or not? We want to dose as many patients correctly as possible. And we're going to compare our algorithm to existing um, bended algorithms in the literature and the physician who always starts off with a medium dose. Uh, and then I have something called an oracle, uh, which is the best possible you could achieve from all of the data in hindsight. So this is kind of the gold standard. You can't beat it. Okay, so um, in this plot, I'm basically plotting the fraction of incorrect dosing decisions as a function of the number of patients the algorithm has seen so far. Um, so without maybe getting into the plot too much, basically what this shows is that our algorithm converges much faster than the existing banded algorithms, uh, but it beats the physician after about 200 patients. Um, so the physician always gets about 53% accuracy because that's the percentage of the population that's supposed to get a medium dose to begin with, whereas the remaining patients might get a low dose or a high dose. Um, and our algorithm basically elevates that number to 65%. So it correctly doses about 20% more patients relative to the physician. Okay, so we took this to some clinicians and we said, hey, we have this algorithm. It seems to be better on average uh, compared to uh, what physicians do in practice today. And they said, well, that's nice, but uh, you know, our uh, giving a normal dose kind of hedges the bet between a low dose and a high dose. Whereas your algorithm can give a low dose to a patient who's supposed to get a high dose or a high dose to a patient who's supposed to get a low dose, which is much worse. Um, so we went back to the data and saw, well, that's bad. How often does this happen? Uh, and it turns out there's about a 0.7% chance that we give a dose that's kind of two buckets off. Uh, so this is you know, quite small, but you know, important. But what we get in return for this is a huge improvement in correctly dosing patients who are supposed to get a low dose. So these are the patients the physicians always get wrong because they always give them a medium dose, but our algorithm actually gets 57% of them correct the first time. So that's a trade-off that you know, might be worth making depending on the clinical setting. Uh, but these are the kinds of caveats or challenges that come with these kinds of personalized decision-making algorithms. Uh, so just to summarize, to make time for questions, uh, we introduced this lasso bandit algorithm for personalized medical decision making. Um, it has some nice statistical properties, like I mentioned. Uh, it actually converges exponentially faster in the big data setting. And it seems to have practical value based on this uh, warfarin dosing case study. Uh, it seems like, you know, it's not just a theoretical guarantee, but it does converge quickly, but it has caveats, as I mentioned. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up and take any questions from you guys. Hey. Um, Hi. 
I just wanted to say that, that what we were just talking about is that you just did a beautiful job of explaining <laughs> an incredibly complicated topic. <laughs> And um, thank you. I, I just want to say thank you. I actually don't have a question, but I just <laughs> wanted to say you, you, it was so beautiful how you were able to do that. So oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Yes. Yes, go ahead. Um, I thought it was very interesting that the physician said back, well, there's a high risk. I wonder if you, you could understand. Uh -huh. Whether there's a what the high risk is for the physician getting it incorrect, uh, and then maybe do a study to explain that the algorithm uh -huh. has a lower risk potentially than a physician who's making those decisions. Right. So, um, oh, I'm not actually sure how this clicker works. Can you roll it back? Oh, there you go. Okay. So I guess uh, what we're trying to show in this table is it's mess of numbers. Uh, but basically, uh, physicians give everyone the medium dose. So there's about 33% of the population that's supposed to get a low dose. So these are all patients who are going to be at risk for internal bleeding. And when I say low, medium, these are like very clinically relevant differences. So I think low is you're supposed to be three milligrams or below, and medium is five, and high is seven or more. So being off by two milligrams is, you know, no joke. Um, and then again, there's 13% of the population that's supposed to get a high dose. Um, so these are patients who are at risk for, um, you know, not getting sufficient coagulation. Uh, so if you had a good sense of what the cost was uh, for a patient who gets a dose that's, you know, so off, then it would be pretty easy to calculate the cost of what the physicians are doing and then compare it to the cost of what we're doing. Or you know, occasionally being two buckets off. Uh, we had some trouble finding those numbers, which is why we didn't plug it into here. Uh, I think it also varies uh, based on the frequency that the doctor checks with the patient when they're monitoring this INR ratio, it's, it's an outpatient setting. Um, one of the things that uh, when we talked to this clinician, they suggested is that even if um, they don't, if a hematologist doesn't want to implement our algorithm exactly, if we predict a high dose or a low dose and they start the patient on a normal dose anyway, maybe they can accelerate the procedure of adjusting the dose because they know that probably the patient's going to need a higher dose or a lower dose. And that way, you know, they can play it safe and keep with the usual guidelines, but still use this information. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for the question. How do you guys like the conference? <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Well, thank you very much for coming to the talk, and I hope to see you guys there.